a great pleasure to be able to moderate this panel on Iraq's regional opportunities, <laughs> perspectives for Iraq and its neighbors. One of the things that uh, I teach rather assiduously in my conflict management courses is that geography may not be your only destiny, but it's certainly part of your destiny. And uh, certainly that applies in the case of Iraq. And what I propose to do is to take both an inside outlook, that is, from Baghdad to the region, and then a look from the region into Iraq, to think about <clears throat> whether the goals of Iraq and its neighbors are in some way consistent, uh, and if so, how can they be helpful to each other in stabilizing a part of the world which has really been through hell, if I can put it bluntly. Uh, this is not what uh, most of us predicted or would have liked to see uh, when the Americans invaded in, in uh, 2003. And uh, many people in the room actually worked very hard to avoid uh, the anything like the current situation. Some worked on it. And failed, and failed. Uh, let me do some brief introductions of our speakers. Mohammed Yahya is a, uh, an expert on Middle East security. He's a Saudi, looks at these questions uh, from a Gulf perspective and a GCC perspective. Uh, Liesl Hintz is an assistant professor of international relations here at Johns Hopkins SICE, and I have to admit I've met her for the first time this afternoon. There's a lot of us. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she has a particular interest in, in, in identity and foreign policy, that is in how internal politics and, and foreign policy affect each other, and she has a particular expertise in Turkey, which is uh, one of Iraq's very important neighbors. Sayed Hussein Musavian has many claims to fame, not the least of which is that he's a professor at Princeton, where I got my PhD, so uh, we have a certain school tie affinity. Uh, he uh, spent many years inside the Iranian government and inside its national security apparatus. Uh, he's now at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, which if you haven't been there, it's uh, got to be a great pleasure to be a professor there. He, um, he will be interested in part in, in that other big question in Washington right now, the nuclear question. And I'll ask him to, I'll press him a little to comment on how what's happening in that arena is affecting how Iran sees Iraq and vice versa. And then last, but by far not least, the Honorable Ambassador Farid Yassin, who has uh, many distinctions. He joined the foreign ministry in 2004. Uh, he has been director of policy planning a couple of times. And since November of 2016, he's been Iraq's ambassador in Washington. And I must say, from my earliest moments remembering our meetings, always somebody who understood a hell of a lot about what was going on uh, inside Iraq and between Iraq and its neighbors. So uh, I think, Mr. Ambassador, we should start with you uh, to give Baghdad's view of its neighborhood and maybe a little beyond its neighborhood because nobody can ignore uh, the big neighbor in the room, which happens to be Washington, and maybe we wouldn't want to ignore the other neighbors in the room, like Russia and, and other, other important world players. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, can you give us, I'm afraid this time it, it really does apply, but I have to ask you not to take too much time doing it, uh, a tour d'horizon. Okay, well, it's a good thing I speak French. 
Um, <laughs> you know, you've, I, I recognized what you said about the importance of geography. Geography is something you don't, uh, uh, you don't choose, but like family. And somebody, somebody else has said it differently. It's a location, location, location. So we got a good location. It gives us a lot of oil and resources. We've got water. Uh, we've got history. A hell of a lot of history. Um, and history is important because it tells you how you deal with geography and sometimes how geography deals with you. And that's an important message because one of the critical issues that our region will have to deal with, and this often gets forgotten, and that is my main point of contention with your administration, is climate change. Uh, that being said, um, Iraq uh, is about 100 years old, a little less. Um, and it's a real, in, a, in a really interesting uh, neighborhood. And let's do a tour d'horizon of our neighbors. So they span uh, many cultures, many languages, uh, many faiths, well, actually mostly Muslim, but uh, different interpretations, uh, some more um, um, intense than others. Um, and it is also a country that is at, at, the, at, at the crossroads of many zones of influence. So Iraq is, has been called, and I hate that appellation, you know, the, uh, a portal of the, the eastern portal of the Arab world, which implies wars. That was something that was very popular with, with the former regime. Uh, but it is, it is, in a sense, true in that to our east we have, uh, you know, Persian Empire. To the north we have, we have the, the Turks. To the east, uh, to the west, sorry, to the, to the west, we have uh, Arab countries uh, uh, that are, in, in fact, an extension of our, of our population. And to the south, we have the font of Arab and Islamic culture, which is Saudi Arabia. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, the ever-present Kuwait. Um, and uh, this is important. Uh, Iraq being at these crossroads, being the, I, I look on, being 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 uh, the uh, locus of, of many many migrations, we found our we find ourselves to be at the center of uh, of structures that extend beyond our borders. So we have we have uh, tribes that span you know, the, the northern north-south axis from Saudi Arabia all the way to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to Syria. We have the same thing with the Kurds, Kurdish tribes who span the border with Turkey and with Iran. Um, I myself have actually cousins in Kuwait. In fact, two of them are, are ambassadors of Kuwait. That's uh, something I'm really proud of. Um, so in a sense, uh, Iraq is enmeshed with its, with, its, with, its, with, its neighboring, with its neighboring countries, culturally, ethnically, uh, you know, uh, demographically. And, and that dictates on us why, what our policy should be. Uh, and I, I, I paraphrase this by saying, in a sense, that, uh, that Iraq is somewhat in a similar situation to Switzerland. And people, when I say this, people start to you know, look goo-goo-eyed at me. Why is he saying this? Well, if you look at Switzerland, uh, it, it, has, it shares some of these uh, same characteristics that Iraq has. Uh, it has multiple languages. It has, uh, it's both Catholic, Protestant, with some cantons that are mixed. Uh, you know, it, it has <coughs> cultural affinities. Some of its, parts of its population has cultural affinities with some of its neighbors. Uh, and what is known about it is that it is a neutral country. And the question is, why is it neutral? Well, <coughs> because most of the wars of the 17th and 18th centuries were either sectarian or national in nature. And had Switzerland taken sides with any of these, in any of these wars, it would have torn it apart. We're in a similar situation. So the only uh, policy that is consistent with the way Iraq is is one of a strong, proactive neutrality. Emphasize every single word of those. Strong, proactive neutrality. Strong because it's a tough neighborhood. You know, we need, and in fact, the, the Swiss Army is one of the best trained in the area. And uh, after you know, this interlude with ISIS, I think we have the best uh, you know, special forces uh, 
in, in the region. So thank you, ISIS, but no thank you. Um, and our history has told us how we have interacted, how, how we should interact with this. Iraq's first international pact, as soon as it became independent, was the Sadabat Pact, which is which not, not a lot of people talked about, talk about, but it was a non-aggression pact between Turkey, the former occupying power, um, uh, Iran, and Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan didn't exist at the time. Um, and then there was a later incarnation of this, uh, which was the Baghdad Pact, uh, which included a few other countries. At this time, Pakistan was there, and of course, you know, the great Western powers, but that was put a, put a stop to uh, by the great um, rivalry between East and West that uh, we <coughs> fell prey to, thanks to the coup uh, that took place in 1958. So uh, when, when you go to the uh, website of the Iraqi Foreign Ministry, you will read that we will not be part of any axes in the region. And that's another way of formulating that we will not side in a war from any to with any. We want to have a, a proactive uh, neutrality that respects others' uh, internal affairs, but that wants to exchange as much as possible with them. Uh, and one of the things that we have suffered over the last uh, 10 years, I would say, uh, people say that a lot of some countries have meddled more than others in our country. In fact, it's not that. It's that many countries were not present in Iraq. Uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm specifically talking about, about our Arab neighbors. Uh, they could have done a lot to help us. I think uh, their absence was a mistake. I think that absence uh, is recognized as a mistake <coughs> um, by their decision make makers now. There has been uh, a readjustment. That's one of the major uh, developments of the last, uh, last uh, few months, that now uh, all countries all neighboring countries of Iraq are involved, from Saudi Arabia to Iran to, to, to Turkey uh, and to Jordan, where we're working on increasing our levels of interactions with them. For example, with regard to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, we've elevated our level, our level of interaction from a uh, joint commission to a coordinating council with trade missions, with, uh, with exchanges. Of course, this doesn't mean that we're going to curtail or cut down on any of our exchanges with any of our other neighbors. They're going apace. We're, 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 we're trying to uh, build new projects, for example, with Jordan that will, I think, not be of benefit not only uh, to us in Iraq and Jordan, but to the whole region, as a, as a matter of fact. And so, like I said, a proactive neutrality, friends with all, enemies uh, to none, unless those that, that want to be our enemies. In this case, we won't let them, but uh, I think this is, this is where we are. Uh, uh, let me just say one, 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 one more thing. Uh, we're in a, in a hard position right now. We've had to uh, confront uh, a crisis that very few countries have had to deal with. Uh, I've seen peop people address Iraq as if it were a uh, fragile state. I, there I really beg to differ. I think it's an exemplar of resilience. Um, and we have, you know, weathered the big storms, of, including this, this, you know, uh, referendum business. Um, I think, I think, you know, wiser minds will prevail, and and things will simmer down for the benefit of all Iraqis. And I say all Iraqis, uh, purposefully. Uh, but the damage that has been left by ISIS to the infrastructure of Iraq, to the land of Iraq, to the people of Iraq needs to be repaired. And we can't do that on, on our own. And there again, that will give us another opportunity to interact even further with, with our neighbors. And I'm, and I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, Kuwait has decided, uh, and we're grateful for that, to uh, host an international donor conference in January of uh, this coming year to help us uh, repair, rebuild, um, and um, Restart, uh, you know, certainly the, the, the parts of Iraq that were occupied by ISIS, there'll be a focus on that. But we should not forget the other parts of Iraq that also had to, to suffer uh, the neglect that ensued from having the, all the resources of the country devoted to the war against ISIS, which we will be about to finish, I hope, soon enough.
victoriously. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I think, well, I'm going to press you a little bit in the future on Turkey and Iran in particular, okay. but let's, uh, let's look a little bit from the outside, okay. and, and, and we'll have another opportunity to do that. Uh, Liesl, Turkey? Turkey, yes. How does it view, what does it want to see in Iraq? Mm -hmm. uh, how does it go about trying to achieve that? Um, so Turkey's had a really um, sort of interesting developing relationship with, A, with the, the Turkish central government, but uh, sorry, with the Iraqi central government in Baghdad, but also specifically with the KRG. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the changing nature of identity politics in Turkey and changing institutional structures in Turkey. Um, previous governments in Turkey that were either run or influenced by um, the secular military were very opposed to any kind of political recognition um, of the Kurds, uh, particularly because Turkey also has a very large Kurdish minority um, that is divided in its goals, some of whom want just cultural rights, some of whom want uh, independence, some of whom want regional autonomy, some of whom just want not to be oppressed uh, forever. Um, so, you know, the, the Turkey's had sort of a, a a two-pronged approach to Iraq in the sense that it deals with Baghdad and it deals with the KRG um, in two very different political paths. Um, in the previous, uh, you know, in the past couple of years, particularly <laughs> under Abadi, there were a lot of sectarian tensions um, between uh, the Sunni uh, Justice and Development Party, the ruling AKP in Turkey, which pursues what I call an Ottoman Islamist understanding of uh, Turkish national identity that sort of both defines what it means to be a Turk, but also defines how Turkey's policy should approach the region. Um, and that is as former home of the Caliphate and the Sultanate and the head of Sunni Islam, a power that, you know, by its, its historical legitimacy should be able to strongly influence the affairs of its neighbors. And part of this we see um, in the now quite defunct uh, you know, no zero problems with neighbors strategy, uh, which, you know, and now everybody, it's almost the rigor that you have to say now Turkey has zero neighbors with zero problems. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, if, if Iraq is the Switzerland, Turkey is, is quite the opposite in the sense that, you know, kingdom. pardon? It's the middle kingdom. It's, well, it's, there's so many metaphors for it, but, you know, yes, Turkey pursued what some historians have called an act of neutrality during World War II, kind of trying to play both sides without necessarily um, <coughs> getting involved in conflicts, but under the AKP, the foreign policy orientation um, undergirded by a doctrine of strategic depth. Um, which was the sort of brainchild of former foreign minister, prime minister, and now kind of shuffled out of power, Ahmed Davutoglu, um, you know, who was uh, an intellectual who saw Turkey as having, you know, really missed out on opportunities to forge, for, to forge relationships with its neighbors. It saw previous secular Western-oriented governments as having looked at Muslim populations as backward, ha having not wanting to be seen as having any kind of Middle Eastern ties whatsoever, and so therefore missed out on economic, security, uh, and identity relations that it could have forged with these countries, and Iraq was one of them. Um, and so, you know, under this strategic depth policy, there were many, many outreaches. Um, again, both with Baghdad, uh, but also both with the KRG. And uh, Erdogan was the first Turkish head of state to visit Erbil, for example, on an official visit. Um, Turkey opened uh, a consulate in Erbil in 2010. Um, so it's, you know, it's really uh, from a Sunni Shia perspective, from a Turkish Kurdish perspective, from a perspective of a country that views itself, rightly or wrongly, as a legitimate regional power whose interests should be taken into consideration, um, you know, Turkey really saw Iraq as, uh, as a way to try to cooperate in terms of its problems with the PKK, for example, um, being allowed to pursue PKK forces across the border into, uh, into Iraq. It has very, uh, up until the referendum, although I actually, I, I disagree the extent to which, and we'll probably talk about the referendum a little bit later, but I disagree about arguments saying that Erdogan, the, the former prime minister, now, now president of Turkey, is really upset with Erbil for holding the referendum. I think he has to say that. I think that, you know, he's worried about his own Kurds doing the same thing, 
but at the same time, he is more than excited about the prospect of a Sunni ally in the region and the economic development that comes from the oil flows that are coming from, from the KRG. So it's been, again, this kind of two-pronged uh, approach to Iraq, dealing with them separately. And of course, Turkey's outreaches to the KRG have scuppered relationships with uh, Baghdad, particularly under Abadi, where there was this really heightened secu uh, sectarian rhetoric that was being tossed back and forth. Um, but I think, you know, uh, Turkey, with its outreaches or its sort of um, it's uh, sending forces to Idlib in Syria, really wants to play a very strong uh, regional role and sees Iraq and the KRG as potential players and, and partners in that. Thank you. Mohammed. Yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabia is one of these places which stood aloof a little for a while. Uh, but how is the kingdom seeing Iraq today? Yeah. I think for more than a while. Uh, over the past year, we've seen uh, diplomatic relations restored. We've seen the border crossing between Iraq and Saudi Arabia opened. Uh, there's now a Saudi consulate in, in, in Erbil. Uh, so relations between Saudi Arabia and Iraq um, have, have improved uh, you know, almost beyond recognition over the past, uh, past several months. Uh, what happened was after the 2003 inv invasion, the U.S. invasion, um, uh, the Saudis refused to engage um, uh, Iraq, and the, the, the uh, logic behind that was that, you know, um, uh, something you'll, you'll hear quite often is that Prince Saud al-Faisal, uh, our re uh, late uh, foreign minister, uh, told the Bush administration, you know, you don't go and solve one problem in Iraq because you're going to get five others. Uh, you know, um, the Saudi government had its, its fair share of problems with, uh, with Saddam, there was deep enmity, but they were against uh, uh, the idea of the invasion. Uh, the Bush administration asked uh, Saudi Arabia to, you know, look after their interests, come into Iraq, be involved in the political <coughs> process in Iraq, uh, uh, in a, in a post-invasion setting. Uh, but the response was, you know, this is a U.S. problem, uh, and the U.S. has to fix it on its own. Um, however, soon after uh, 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 the invasion happened, uh, and then what you'll hear from Saudi officials, is that uh, Nouri al-Maliki came into power, and his sectarian politics, his leaning towards Iran, uh, would have made uh, engagement impossible. I don't know if that holds true. I don't know if uh, no engagement was a sound policy at any point. Uh, but today, it's very clear that there's political will to reverse that on, on, on many different levels, as the ambassador mentioned. Uh, uh, and I think the interest that the Saudis have, they, there's an understanding today that you're not going to get a perfect solution. You're not going to uh, you know, eliminate ties between uh, Iran and Iraq. You're not going to be able to change geography. Uh, but what you will uh, be able to do is, is help Iraq reach uh, a stage that's agreeable, uh, 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 at least nominally, to, to all of its Arab neighbors. An independent Iraq, uh, as the ambassador mentioned, a strong, proactive Iraq that uh, has a government representative of its own people, and a government that, that is, is after um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, development and prosperity in Iraq, and a unified Iraq. Uh, and that's the idea. It's good uh, uh, representative uh, government, uh, governance. Thank you very much. Professor Moussavia, it's a difficult moment in U.S.-Iran relations, and it has implications for Iran-Iraq as well. Thank you. I would say the first and the most important Iranian policy objective in Iraq, in relation with Iraq, is to have a friendly, friendly relation with Iraq because even relations between Iran and Iraq before uh, revolution was problematic. And right after revolution, Saddam invaded Iran, and the con two countries, they were engaged for eight, in eight years' war. Therefore, that would be extremely important for Iran, a peaceful, friendly coexistence and uh, good relationship with uh, such a neighbor, such an important neighbor like Iraq. The second important would be uh, security and stability in Iraq because Iranians, they really feel the security and stability of Iraq is part of security and stability of Iran because Iran and Iraq, they have 1,500 kilometers of common borders. And every insecurity or instability in Iraq would immediately have a huge impact on the security and stability situation in Iraq. The third is about uh, integrity 
of Iraq, Iranians are very worried, sensitive about possibility of any disintegration. Everybody now is talking about possible independence of Kurdistan, but there has been some maps uh, distributed about uh, 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 independent country Sunni, independent country Shia, independent country Kurdistan. Therefore, uh, keeping the integrity of Iraq, I believe, would be uh, the third uh, uh, policy objective of Iran. The fourth is eradicating terrorism, because the presence of terrorism in Iraq would be the biggest national security threat to uh, security of Iraq. That's why Iranians, they have invested so much blood and treasure to fight terrorism in Iraq, to cooperate with the Iraqi army to, to, to eradicate the terrorism. Number five, uh, the disputes, the most important dispute before revolution was a treaty about the borders between Iran and Iraq, 1975 treaty, which they ultimately they agreed in 1975 in Algeria between Shah and Saddam. But right after the revolution, Saddam torn the, the, the treaty and invaded Iran. Therefore, strengthening this treaty would be a part of stability and security and good relation between Iran and Iraq. Number six, I would say Iranians, uh, they have been always worried about US military presence in the, in the neighboring country everywhere. It is not about Iraq. They are worried about Persian Gulf in Arabian countries everywhere. I mean, even they are worried about presence of NATO in Turkey, presence of the US in Afghanistan. This is not only about Iraq. But when the US invaded Iraq, I believe one of the main sources of, of, of instability in the region and Iraq, whether this is going to continue or hopefully after Iraq is totally stable, then uh, the, the US military forces would withdraw from Iraq or not. This is a matter of concern for the Iranians. <clears throat> Number seven is, uh, since Iranians and Iraqis, they have centuries of cultural, religious, ethnic, and even family relations. I mean, we have tens of thousands of Iraqis. They have married with Iranians, or hundreds of thousands. I don't know the number, but the number is really big. Iranians, they have married Iraqis. You have six uh, holiest uh, religious sites of Shia in Iraq. We have Marjaria, Najaf, always have been important for Iranians. Therefore, uh, a, a very extensive, close, cultural, social, people to people's relation uh, between Iran and Iraq is also important. Last but not least um, is long-term strategy of Iran, how Iranians they view to be engaged uh, in a sustainable uh, uh, cooperation with Iraq while they can have the same sustainable good relation with the other GCC countries, including Saudi Arabia. Because at the end, as long as we don't have a good relation between Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq, we are not going to have sustainable peace, security, stability in Persian Gulf because they are the three big powers. And the Iranian theory, strategy, initiative is to have a regional cooperation system using the ideas of Westphalia, OSCE, EU, many other regional cooperation systems we have worldwide uh, between <coughs> GCC, which would engulf Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq to bring the rivalries, competitions, in engagement and cooperation as a regional system maintaining peace, security, and stability in the region. We have much more, but I think eight is enough then. <laughs> but let me ask you, how does, how does the current disturbance in relations between Washington and Tehran, how does that affect the situation in Iraq? 
Definitely, it doesn't have a good impact. It has negative impact. But since the U.S. Uh, invaded Iraq, I think Iranians and Americans and Iraqis, they have a type of understanding that Iran-U.S. hostilities should not hurt Iraqi stability and security and interest. That's why I have never seen any Iranian officials to oppose Iraqis to have normal relations with the U.S. And I remember when I was in national security in 2003, after Saddam invaded, uh, the U.S. invaded Iraq, Hakim uh, uh, came to Iran to uh, have a consultation whether uh, Iranians would be angry if he goes to Washington to negotiate with Americans to have normal relation. Everybody said, this is your choice. We have no problem if you're going to have good relation. Even they really are looking for a normal relation between Iraq and Saudi Arabia, because I think Iraq is in well positioned even to mediate between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and the U.S. to decrease the tensions. So what I'm hearing from pretty much everybody is that there aren't a lot of <clears throat> incompatible interests here. There's possibility for not only coexistence, but a good deal of cooperation. And in particular, the question arises, how can cooperation be encouraged in this post-ISIS period. Iraq is going to be going through this difficult, extraordinarily expensive reconstruction process. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, uh, uh, what, what can the neighbors do, Mr. Ambassador, to, to help Iraq come out of it in the right direction? Be generous. Be generous? <laughs> you need money? Well, no, we don't only need money. We need expertise. Um, I, I always make this analogy. I mean, look at the United States. In 1941, it was attacked. Uh, ensued a very rapid phase of militarization, victory in, in four, years, four years later. And then uh, something happened. Uh, the United States uh, took its military class and transformed it into the most productive engine of economic growth through mechanisms like the GI Bill. So, you know, fast forward to Iraq in 2014. We are into a war. Four years later, uh, 2018, hopefully next year, ISIS is going to be a, a, a bad memory, okay? We've had a very strong militarization. In fact, everybody would agree that Iraq is over-militarized now. And here, the example of the United States would be very telling to us. How do we generate our own GI Bill to transform these young men who have really given, all, given their all to save the country, uh, to help them you know, build families, build careers, rebuild the country, add to the country, add to the region, in fact. And there are other examples I can go into um, where we could look to the United States for help. For example, um, uh, again, again, right after the Second World War, you had this wonderful uh, Levittown program. You have all these thousands of, of, of young men coming back from the war. They want to get married, raise kids. They need housing. Levittown programs enabled them to have cheap, affordable, decent housing. And housing is an engine, a non-oil sector <coughs> engine of the economy. Um, it is also these kinds of things that we need, we need to, to look to. And uh, it's, it's not for nothing that we're trying. We'll look forward to the Saudi ex experience because they have companies that are very well versed you know, in civil engineering and, and, and housing and construction and, 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 and so, all sorts of other things. Well, Mohammed, I was going to turn to you next. Uh, uh, there's a need for money. There's a need for technical capacity. Um, both Saudi Arabia and Turkey, I would say, and I'll turn to Lisa next, uh, have real potential in this direction. Are you, are you ready to play? I think Saudi Arabia and, and um, the rest of the GCC countries would be more than willing uh, to both invest and contribute to the rebuilding of post-ISIS areas in Iraq. Um, 
What, one, of, one of the main concerns, though, is, is to eliminate the conditions uh, that, that have to do with governance, that have to do with, with um, uh, the way the military was being run, that allowed groups like ISIS um, uh, to flourish. Uh, the sectarianism, the, the lack of representation uh, uh, for Sunnis in, in government and in the military. So the, these, these are things that need to be addressed. Uh, but the other part has to do with, with the importance of having a strong central government in Iraq and, and having a strong unified Iraq. Iraq that's able to control its borders. You know, Iraq also is, is important because of, of, of its place uh, in the region. Uh, uh, Hezbollah uh, restocking logistically. Uh, armaments that go to Assad, unfortunately, are going through Iraq. Uh, at different points, that might have happened because the government turned a blind eye. That might have happened because of weak um, uh, 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 control <coughs> over certain areas in Iraq. But a strong, cohesive um, uh, Iraqi government with strong control of its borders uh, is, is just the, the first step uh, in, in, in a larger uh, plan for the region in order to, to cut uh, uh, logistical and financial support uh, for, for groups that everybody in the international community views as problematic. If I understand you correctly, yes, Saudi Arabia will be ready to play, but we'd like to see some conditions inside Iraq. Of course, and it's not black and white. I mean, I mean, it will help where it can in certain areas, but um, uh, there's not going to be a carte blanche either way. Lisa, I'll turn to you, but I'll warn Professor Musavian that I'll turn to him next as well, because especially on this question of what happens with the demobilized uh, soldiers, that's an important question also for the Iranian side of the equation. Lisa? So is the AKP in Turkey, is Erdogan ready to play in Iraq? Absolutely. Is the Turkish economy ready to play in Iraq? Not necessarily. Um, and what's really interesting about this is that the Turkish economy has been growing and growing. And it, you know, it depends on how you measure the statistics. And they've actually changed the way in which they measure them, which has made the, the growth look more favorable in the past few years. Um, but you know, Turkey's economy, partially because Turkey underwent such uh, an immense <coughs> financial and, and monetary crisis in 2001, um, they undertook a lot of banking reforms and so forth, and so it was a much more resilient economy come 2008. And so Turkey continues to grow by a decent percentage while its European neighbors, who, by the way, keep telling Turkey, you don't belong, you're not good enough for us, uh, you know, are really suffering. And, and you know, very nationalist Turks took quite a lot of uh, pleasure in seeing Greece not doing so well, frankly. Um, but, you know, in terms of the economic growth that we're seeing, so much of it is undergirded by corruption, by sweetheart deals, by, you know, handing out um, uh, political patronage, by, by you know, in, in, in infusions of hot money that are not necessarily stable. When you look at what's happening with the Turkish currency, when you look at how foreign direct investment is pulling out, I mean, it's really, we've been thinking, you know, observers have been thinking it's on the brink of crisis for years. <coughs> We're stunned that it hasn't happened yet. Um, right now, you have uh, the former Turkish economic minister being indicted by the U.S. government. You have Reza Zarab, who was the Iranian Turkish oil for gold merchant who was trying to avoid uh, sanctions on Iran and make uh, Turkey rich at the same time. He's perhaps going to testify very soon. We don't know if he'll testify, but um, you know, so you have an economy that is really built on quite a lot of corruption. Um, and actually, the way in which that's tied to the construction industry is quite interesting because Turkey would love to expand its construction industry in the KRG um, in Iraq, as it has throughout, um, you know, MENA, throughout the MENA region. Um, but you know, when you actually look at, uh, for example, Transparency International, which is an NGO that measures corruption levels, they look at the percentage of the economy that is based on construction as a way in which to gauge whether or not a country is corrupt, because there's so many you know, hidden ways in which you can funnel money through the construction industry. Um, so you know, how, uh, how successful of a potential economic investor can Turkey be is one element. The other aspect to that is how reliable of a potential ally or regional negotiator can Turkey be. We've seen Turkey clearly try to play this role, and it doesn't necessarily recognize that Iran, Saudi, and Iraq are the biggest powers in the region it would like to think it is, um, or has the most weight that it can throw around. But in terms of the ways in which we've seen what's happened between the US and Turkey over the past two weeks, you know, we have uh, Turkey continually arresting US individuals and consular officials. We had the US on Sunday recognizing this, uh, placing uh, or suspending visas 
So I don't know if I can do uh, research in the future because Turkey then came back and said, okay, we're not going to give out any non-immigrant uh, visas to, to Americans. So they're preventing travel. Um, you know, this is a step to try to rein Turkey in, um, but it's not necessarily an effective one because I think it hurts the wrong people. But if you also see the way in which you know, Turkey has really pulled back from the EU, um, and not just pulled back politically, because it has a you know, significant right to, because you know, the EU hasn't necessarily applied the same standards to Turkey as it did to Croatia, for example, who was able to, to join the EU extremely quickly. Uh, but the way in which it's not only pulled away politically and stopped the reform process, but also you know, started this war of words with, with Germany and with the Netherlands and calling them fascists and Nazis and, and, and you know, this idea that they're going to buy an S-400 missile defense system from Russia that's not compatible with NATO technology. All to the point of saying that Turkey is not necessarily the most reliable ally um, under this particular government. So, um, A, I don't know if the economy can handle it in terms of investment in Iraq, and I don't know how much I would want Turkey at the negotiating table for me in the region. Thank you. Uh, Professor Musavian, if I understand correctly, uh, Iran has already played a quite a strong role in reconstruction in large part of southern Iraq. Uh, and of course, it has a role in Kurdistan as well. How do you envisage, after this defeat of ISIS, the Iranian economic role, but also the Iranian role in this question of demobilization? Because the Hashid al-Shabi, at least some of them, are uh, in some sense related to Iran, get support from Iran, get help from Iran. So. Uh, uh, is Iran ready to see them uh, demobilized or uh, uh, put into um, GI Bill type education programs? Pardon? I got to say something about this. Okay. Uh, please. Ambassador first. Ambassador well, the, 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 the public mobilization, there's a, lot of been, there's a lot that's been said about it. Uh, these are essentially people who rose in response to the call of the Marja'iya in uh, June of 2014 to fill up the space left by the departing army. Uh, many of them were people older than me, and many were younger than the youngest amongst you, and many died. And now, I've seen their faces. I went to Baghdad in, in August and September 2014. You could see them plastered on the walls. So now the prime minister took a, took a brave measure, a smart measure, an intelligent measure, to incorporate them within the armed forces of the Iraqi states. They are official. They are Iraqi. They're not Iranian. We may get some support from Iran, just as we get support from the United States. Okay? Uh, but again, this is an important question. We have to demobilize. It's, a, it's an economic necessity. Uh, it's a human necessity, I think, once this war is going to be over. Uh, and uh, in fact, one, sim one single example I'll mention. So just now we completed um, the discussions with the World Bank. One of the most <coughs> interesting, I think, and useful meetings we had was with the country manager in Colombia, who told us about the Colombian government's program for uh, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. It's something you know, that, that, that caught us by the throat. This is something that we really need. Uh, that's something, uh, you know, uh, everybody with, with the right mind would say, this is something you have to incorporate in Iraq. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, as soon as we left the meeting, I told one of my staffers to get me an appointment with the, with the, with the Colombian ambassador. So, but these are Iraqi forces. Professor. Dan, I understand there is sensitivities in countries like United States, Saudi Arabia, uh, Emirate, even Israelis about Iranian presence or cooperation with Iraqi government or Hezbollah uh, 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 presence in Iraq or support Iraqi government fighting ISIS. But even there is sensitivity in Tehran about the US military presence over there. But everyone, I believe, should respect the fact Iraq is an independent country sovereign government, and they should decide for fighting ISIS 
who can help, which country should play what role. They have invited Iranians to support them to fight ISIS. And Iranians are there only because of the invitation of Iraqi government. Exactly like the US is there because of the invitation of Iraqi government. It is not business of Iranian government, whether Iraqis, uh, Americans are there, or business of Saudis or Americans, if Iranians are there. This is Iraqi government as a sovereign, independent country and government. They decide what to do. This is number one. Number two, undermining the minority, Sunni minorities, is a really important issue. I, I, I fully... Uh, understand what Muhammad is saying. I believe uh, government in Baghdad should be very careful not to give such an impression to minority, Sunni minorities in Iraq. Even if they are 15%, they should have 20% role to give more role to them and to satisfy the GCC countries that the, the, the minority Sunnis, they would be totally respected and immune and they would have a huge role. Number three is the fact on the ground. The US was leading international coalition in 2014, and ISIS was occupying cities, lands of Iraqis, Syrians, one city after one city. Mosul, Kirkuk, and the US military, the US coalition was really helpless. What they could do? Today, 86% of what ISIS gained 2014 in Syria and in Iraq is retaken. They have lost 86%. It is because of what? Iranians and Hezbollah, they have played a very critical, plus hash to shabi. They have played a really important role fighting ISIS. It was the Prime Minister of Iraq, Haider al-Abadi, who said without Iranian support, Baghdad may have collapsed. It was Barzani, the president of Kurdistan region, who said without Iranian support, Erbil would have collapsed. Therefore, such a support, such a presence fighting ISIS should be welcomed. If our friends Saudis, they do not like it, are they in position to give guarantee to Iraqi government today that if Iran leaves, Hezbollah leaves, Hashd al-Shabi leaves, Saudi is in position to put uh, boots on the ground to fight ISIS? None of the Arab countries, they would be able to do it. Therefore, this is, this is something really I really don't understand. Of course, if ISIS is totally eradicated, then whether the Iraqi government would decide to demobilize or integrate to full integration of Hajj the Shabis, this is their business. This is parliamentary, parliament of Iraq, government of Iraq, they have to decide. But I don't really see any Iranians would be willing to be one day military Iranian forces or advisors, to be one day in Iraq if ISIS or terrorism threat is removed. Why they should be there? I mean, other than blood and, 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 and treasure, what is, what is the gain for Iranians? Only to, to, to keep their, their borders safe from ISIS entering Iran and helping the sovereignty, integrity, the stability, and security of Iraq. Yeah. You know, with respect to, uh, to Professor Musavian, Certain elements of the Hashd and Hezbollah and uh, a large number of other Iranian-backed organizations are the reason groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda thrive. I mean, they're not, no less barbaric than ISIS and Al-Qaeda. I mean, we've all seen the videos <coughs> of Abu Israel, a member of the Hashd in Iraq, uh, albeit not, not um, uh, part of the official uh, 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 government-sanctioned uh, Hashd, uh, cutting up an alleged uh, a Sunni 
uh, jihadists, I'm sorry for putting this image in your head, like a kebab over a bonfire. We've seen videos of, of young boys being uh, shot to death by these rogue elements. These rogue elements are backed by Iran. Hezbollah has killed thousands of Americans. Hezbollah has an industry of, of, uh, of taking uh, 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 Western hostages for ransom in order to raise funds. Hezbollah is one of the largest actors in the drug trade internationally. These are terrorist organizations that are as much a problem as ISIS. To sit down and, 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 and posit that these, these organizations are used to fight a group like ISIS is utterly ridiculous, in my opinion. I mean, the view in the Gulf and, and the view in many um, uh, uh, Western uh, uh, policy circles is that these uh, two organizations, these Sunni extremist groups and these Shia extremist groups are equally barbaric, equally criminal, and should be uh, uh, removed uh, from public life and, and removed from the streets in countries like Iraq if these countries were ever to develop. And unfortunately, you know, any country where you see Iranian uh, intervention uh, 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 very prevalent. Look at Iraq, uh, Lebanon right now. Lebanon is a crippled country. In 2003 and 2004, Lebanon used to be a tourist destination for people the, the world over. I was there in 2003 and 2004. You couldn't find a hotel room in that country. Today, it's a ghost town. I was there in August. I mean, Hezbollah is, is stronger than it's ever been. Uh, it, it constantly threatens uh, the Lebanese government uh, uh, to take over Beirut if, if they, if they um, uh, do anything wrong. It's the strongest military power over there. And the reason is it receives armaments, logistical support, and cash from Iran via Iraq and then via Syria. I mean, the past eight years in the city and, and, and elsewhere have uh, distracted from, from the true role that Iran plays in the Levant, in, in uh, uh, Iraq, uh, in Lebanon, in Syria, and it's a truly destructive role that has to be uh, uh, pushed back, eliminated, in order uh, to see a sustained uh, uh, development in these areas. And I think we should be calling a spade a spade. Hezbollah, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, these are all organizations that should be fought. Mohammed, this is my point. Yeah. We should leave it to Iraqi government. Mm -hmm. It is not the business of Iran or Saudi Arabia or the US. Of course, and the Iraqi government has, Iraqi made, government, has made great... If they want Hezbollah, Iran, Hashto Shabi, we should One of the it. positive points is that the Iraqi is government has made a lot of uh, uh, headway yeah. in cutting back uh, but, but, on, 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 on Iranian influence on these rogue elements but, of the Hashd that, that are cutting people up. But you should understand... Uh, just like Iraq, ISIS does. I mean, you should understand Iraqi They understand what the issue is. Iraqi and, government, and, has, they have totally different mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. like what you have. I Let's turn to the Iraqi I'm government for a moment <laughs> yeah, so and but, but, but see what it thinks. Dan, I, I think there's Dan, no disagreement about, that, that, about that, that, Hezbollah. that, that about an Hezbollah. organized hash mm -hmm. that, that is... Hezbollah is, is part of Iraqi, uh, uh, Lebanese political establishment. They are official party, they have representative in parliament, they have representative in Lebanon government, and <laughs> if you ask prime minister of uh, Lebanon or president of Lebanon, are you ready to forgive the, the military power of, to, to forgo the military power of Hezbollah today? They would tell you no. Because without Hezbollah, they would have not been able to kick the Israelis out of Lebanon. Without Hezbollah, ISIS would have occupied part of Lebanon today. You don't like Hezbollah, of course. Iranians also, they don't like your support for ISIS, I mean, Saudi Arabia's support for ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda. There are thousands of reports in U.S. Uh, media, hundreds of official statements by U.S. presidents, ministers, Europeans, they say, where is the source of ideology, money, weapon for these terrorist groups, whether this is ISIS, Al-Ghaida, Jabhat al-Nusra, Boko Haram, all of them, they are coming from one source. And you can read thousands of articles. Even President Trump, who is today a very good strategic partner of Saudi Arabia, before election, you remember, Muhammad, he said Saudi Arabia is source number one of supporting terrorism. Well, now is is strategic partner of Saudi Arabia. I, no problem. But, but the fact is, on the regional issues, my point is here, we should respect the, the view of Lebanon government. Lebanon has a sovereign government. They want Hezbollah. If Hezbollah is not there, any time, any day, Israelis, they can invade, they can occupy Lebanon. I think it's better not to let obfuscate me, and me, stick to facts. This is why Turkey can't get a word I mean, in edgewise in the region, by the way. <laughs> let, me, let me stop both of you there and just say that we've registered a very clear disagreement about 
who supports whom and who is a terrorist and who isn't a terrorist. So one should ask Rafi Hariri. I think I think there's very clear uh, difference of view. But Mr. Ambassador Farid, I'd like to talk to turn to you and say, you know. Can I say just one sentence? Yes, I do. I want to. Okay, now one sentence. I want to give you. No one sentence, and I'll absolutely. say it, and it's very brief. Nothing is worse than ISIS. Period. Nothing is worse than ISIS. Period. But the question. Except maybe son of ISIS, but. The question I have for you. Let's prevent them from coming. The question I have for you is. Uh, when you talk about demobilization, demilitarization, you're talking about not only the Iraqi army, but also no, the clearly. Hashid al-Shabi. No, no, clearly. I, and the, I mean, we have a lot of people under uniform. We'd like to, just as the United States did after the Second World War, it's the GIs they sent to, uh, to college. This is what we want to do. But what will you do with those who are still irregular? Uh, we want to regularize those who are, uh, ir whatever you want to call them, but there is a gu guiding principle of the Iraqi government that it's working hard to implement, which is the Iraqi government must have monopoly of force, period, as in any government that respects itself. Yep. Well, I think that's an area where all could agree. Okay. Yes. Let course. me let me do this. Uh, we're about half an hour from uh, having to conclude, so I was going to open the floor to questions. I particularly invite questions about Turkey, <laughs> only because Liesel has been left out a little bit here. That's, that's and, how Turkey feels. And and I don't. Wanna... I can talk about I, I can talk about how Turkey also sponsors terrorism. I can talk about how Turkey allows ISIS fighters to travel through its borders. I can talk about how Turkey started agreeing to participate in the fight against ISIS on the day that it began bombing the PKK so that the international community was not paying attention to the, pro the idea that the solution process had fallen apart in Turkey. It can contribute to these conversations. It just doesn't always have a, as strong of a voice, perhaps, as, as, its, <laughs> as its partners. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, please, here. And uh, please state your name and affiliation. And uh, keep it brief and a question. I will try. Thank you. And my name is Khalid Fatah from Voice of America. Um, uh, well, uh, thank you for this opportunity and great discussion about the, this issue in Iraq. Um, uh, I think uh, the panelists, they missing the two main issues. One of them, there is a sectarian war in Iraq between lead by Saudi Arabia uh, the Sunni side and the Iran, uh, the Shi'i side. This conflict, it's inside the Iraq and the Iraqi government is taking a side in this conflict. This is the reason we hearing from many sources that the, a group of the terrorism, which is, if the Iranian talking about it, and when they, Sunni or Saudi Arabia, they consider them as a freedom fighter in Iraq. So this is the issue of the, of the Iraq. It is the sectarian. The government, they have a sectarian policy, and this is the, the, the reason that that's ISIS expanded in Iraq and occupied one of third of it. I take that to be a comment. Is there yes, a question? Yes, the, my question to the ambassador is, is the Iraqi government ready to get rid of that policy to build and to create a stable Iraq? And the other thing, uh, my question to Mr. Mosawi, he mentioned to the 1974 uh, agreement in Algeria. 1975. 74. Um, uh, I think you forget to, to, uh, to say what's the reason of that agreement that Iraq give up a part of its land to Iran. There is an issue, it's called Kurdish issue in Iran, in Turkey, in Syria, uh, and in Iraq. And uh, this issue, if not being solved, this conflict it will continue. The conflict, the sectarian conflict, and the national let me, uh, conflict. Let me stop you there. No, let me stop you there. Okay. You've asked two good questions, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Well, actually, I, I, I see myself as uh, you know, an employee of the government, but I serve the state, okay? The question that you're asking should be arrest, addressed to elected officials. So I suggest the following. 
mid-November, we're getting a visit by the Speaker of the Iraqi Parliament, uh, Salim Jabouri. Okay, so why don't you host him here, and you can come back and ask him that question yourself. Seems a good offer okay. to me. Uh, but I serve the state, and the state is non-sectarian. Professor? The 1975 treaty between Iran and Iraq was not about Kurdistan of Iran. It was about the borders and how to define the borders. If you are for integration or disintegration of countries like Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, to have independent Kurdistan, uh, I don't believe anyone would support internationally except Israel. And the regional countries, every country would resist to keep their integrity and sovereignty. This integration, if it happens in any country, whether this is Iraq or Syria, is not going to end to that country. This would continue. Many countries, they would collapse. And I believe at the end, Iranians and Turkish, Turks, they are the most strong countries which they would be able to keep their integrity and uh, uh, sovereignty. The others, they would be the most vulnerable to any dis disintegration. This is very dangerous but idea Professor, which we are let me, <clears throat> let me ask you to follow up on that. How would Iran like to see the future evolution of what happens between Erbil and Baghdad? We have facts on the ground that have been established. Um, what, what do you think is needed to move forward to prevent the kind of disintegration you're talking um, about? Ambassador knows better than me, but as far as I understand, full implementation of Iraqi constitution because this was negotiated for something like one year ambassador between Kurds, Sunnis, and Shias. Americans, they were there. Many countries, they were involved. Ultimately, they agreed on a new constitution. This constitution should be respected. If Kurds, they have rights, some rights, undermined by Baghdad, based on this constitution, this should be revived. Otherwise, this integration is not solution. Can well, I speak I, quickly on the Kurdish yes, issue? Yes, please. Um, because you know, I think this is something that we. I'm surprised we didn't have sort of a, a, a question asked to all of us on this because I think it's especially not only timely but incredibly important in understanding not only internal politics but regional politics. Um, you know, a lot of people would look at Turkish politics and say almost every issue has to do with the Kurds in some way or another. Um, you know, the current ruling and Justice and Development Party government, if it did anything well. They did make an outreach to the Kurds with the solution process from 2013 to 2015. And part of this had to do not only with trying to stop the essential civil war um, that's been going on since 1984, um, but also to improve its, its relations in the region. Um, its relations with Iran, with Iraq, and with Syria are intimately intertwined with the Kurdish issue. And all four of those countries have played Kurdish politics when it suits their interests. Um, Syria supporting uh, camps where PKK uh, fighters have been trading. Um, so there's, there's a key interest in Turkey from a national security perspective, from a democratization perspective, and also from a foreign policy perspective that affects Iran, Iraq, and Syria in solving the Kurdish issue. And I think, you know, looking back and analyzing what went wrong with that, I mentioned that it started bombing the PKK on the same day that it agreed to start fighting ISIS, is, and I think that this is a a lesson for you know countries in terms of, of what can go wrong when you try to have national reconciliation and democratic federalism and all these kinds of things is that the Kurds were played as a political card in Turkish domestic politics. And the outreaches to the Kurds were mostly in uh, sort of the pursuit of the AKP's presidential project that is moving forward with a constitutional referendum that will allow Erdogan to institute presidentialism and to stay in power. He saw the Kurds as a potential ally. He looked around the domestic political constituency and saw them as an ally. And they mm -hmm. saw this as an opportunity to finally move forward in terms of having cultural and political rights and potentially some form of autonomy. And what happens when you have a man who is so focused on this kind of 
policy and this kind of ambition is that once those Kurds were no longer willing to support the presidential project, if you remember what happened in Kobani, and the uh, blaming of Kurds rightfully in the sense that Turkey was allowing ISIS fighters to, to live uh, unscathed in Turkey and to flow across the borders, the Kurds thought, you know, you don't have our back, why should we have yours? And they pull out of the presidential project and the sort of, you know, solution process falls apart. So this issue that has so many regional implications in terms of Turkey-KRG relations, in terms of Turkey-Baghdad relations, um, in terms of Turkey's relations with, with Syria and Iran as well, can be subject to the whims of you know, an individual, and at this point it doesn't really make sense to call the AKP a party, it's an individual-led party. Um, you know, they can be subject to these personal ambitions, and I think that that is an important lesson that we need to take away for any country that has you know, a minority that would like its rights to be more well respected, but might be subject to being vulnerable to being exploited in that process. Mr. Ambassador, it's your country. Uh, Indeed it is. I, I suspect you agree with uh, oh, Professor oh, Moussavian on the Constitution. Well, well I, I definitely. I mean, it's, it's a road map. Uh, we want to we wanna keep our house in order, and the order is dictated by the Constitution, which spells out the duties and the, and the privileges of, of each community. It's been really well, th well thought out, although it does leave some things to be yet completed. But I wanted to address three issues. Um, some have mentioned, uh, Mr. Mufasavian has mentioned uh, border issues, uh, river issues. Uh, that is one thing, uh, one point of uh, discussion that we'll have for years to come with our neighbors in Turkey and in Syria, and in Syria and, 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 and Iran. And Turkey. Uh, uh, Turkey, Syria, and, and Iran. Uh, because uh, we have been absent uh, through, because of the war, because of the, uh, the fact that the uh, previous Iraqi government was, was not interested in, in pursuing this or couldn't. Um, dams have been built on, on, on the rivers that, that, that feed our land. Uh, they have been dried up. We really have to reconsider um, our rights as a as as a as a, um, as a downstream country on 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 two of the main main rivers of history. Uh, we're suffering from this. Uh, one thing. Second thing. Uh, you know, after we defeat ISIS, uh, of course, we'll have the battle of reconstruction to win. But there are two others that we will need to to, to address. One is corruption, and that's one of the things that the Iraqi woman is in intent on focusing on. It's as bad as, it's, it's almost as bad as, 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 as terrorism, and in, in fact, it's intimately sometimes related. Uh, terrorism, but also uh, governance. How to make sure that people, in the end, have a sense of ownership of both the political process and the economic process of the country. And that's the way for you to develop citizenship. Which brings me to the politics that we have, and that's my final point. Up to now, um, although less so than in, than in recent years, um, our, our politics have been identity politics. Uh, too much so. There are reasons for that. You know, the, the, the backlog of the fact that uh, the previous regime uh, denied identities to a lot of people, so they just flourished as soon as the lid was taken off. Uh, but also, inappropriate electoral systems that were implemented not by the CPA for once, but by the United Nations, that, that, that promoted identity voting. And there are really promising signs, uh, talking to different politicians, talking, even looking at the names of the various political parties, that indicate that there is a yearning within the Iraqi electorate writ large for issues that are important to them as voters, as electors, as citizens. I mean, uh, uh, state of law. That's a strong sign. People voted for it because of what it sim sim signifies, I mean. Um, one, one political party had its, its uh, which was known in 2000 uh, and, and, and nine or 2006, I don't remember, uh, 2009, as uh, the martyrs list has become the citizens list. Citizen, okay? And now this very same group has become the national, not Islamic, not a national wisdom movement. 
there is a yearning for peop of people of the electorate for ideas that represent uh, governance. And I, will, I won't mention his name, but I know of a prominent politician who has told me that he was, he was going to develop an electoral platform based on governance issues, based on services to people, based on uh, the duties that, that, that elected officials have towards their electors, uh, to run on it. And if he's successful, he, will, he intends to try to build a coalition of like-minded parties within the parliament that would agree to it. And that would give us a platform, perhaps to move us increasingly from identity politics to issues politics. Let me open up the floor again. I think I'd better take one, two, three, but brief. Ask a question, but if you can. In, introduce yourself. Uh, Namo Abdullah, the Washington correspondent for Rudao. Uh, I would like to ask a question, and if you can uh, weigh in on, the, on that issue as well, I would really appreciate it. So, uh, there's uh, an editorial in the Wall Street Journal arguing that uh, uh, the Kurds are right to feel abandoned by the United States. And what the United States did in Kirkuk sets a bad precedent for other allies in the world because the Kurds, as the paper argues, has been our best and most reliable ally. Would you agree that the Kurds are right to feel abandoned because there's this feeling of resentment actually in the social media toward the United States. And if any of you can weigh in, I would really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, Nike. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nike Chin with the VOA as well. Uh, I have a question for the ambassador. Could you Please give us your assessment of the situation in Kirkuk. I don't know you, if you got a chance to read the statement uh, from, uh, uh, I can read it to you. Um, the Iraqi Kurdistan region president uh, Barzani's statement earlier today. I, I actually have not, I've been running around, I should. Okay, uh, let me read it to you. you uh, this is from the reports. So um, he pledges to preserve the achievements of the Kurds despite Kirk, uh, Kirkuk setback. And also, according to um, another TV station, um, he is going, he's urging the Kurds to avoid civil war. So I would like to know um, your insights or your thoughts about this statement. Do you see any indication of a sense of calm over there? Thank you. One more, one more question. And my question is for uh, uh, Mosevian. You talk about, you asked Iraqi to bring not 15% of the Sunni to government, but 20. But how about your government? I mean, I know the Kurd, I'm a Kurd. But the way your governor treat the Kurd, I mean, it go back like United States in the 1800s, they treat Sunni like a slave. And daily, they hang about 18 Kurd every day. Okay, let me, so, let me stop you, you there, that? and we'll get an answer to that as well. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I think you wanted to respond on Mr. Baksani. Well, um, avoiding civil war, I'm all for it. Um, <laughs> you know, um, uh, but on Kirkuk, uh, Kirkuk is not part of the KRG. It's part, according to the Constitution of the Disputed Territories, under Article 140. And uh, what has recently happened is a redeployment that is consistent with the with the Constitution that seeks to uh, reach out to where we were in the status quo ante before ISIS came and disrupted our, our, uh, our country. Um, Professor Musavian, on the question of treatment of Kurds in uh, Sorry. Sunnis and uh, <clears throat> Iran. Iranian courts, uh, after the revolution, they have been free about their language. Officially, never there has been any restriction, education, judiciary, even in the courts, the, the judges uh, are ruling based on Sunnah, not Shia. Therefore, they are in parliament, they are in government. Those courts, I mean, right after Saddam invaded in Iran, in parallel, there was a separatist movement to integrate 
Kurdistan of Iran. Saddam decided to, to disintegrate Khuzestan, and there was a movement on the north to disintegrate Kurdistan. Since then, Iran has been in fight with the terrorist Kurdish uh, uh, group, which they have been freedom fighter. If this is... <clears throat> oh, okay. No, yes, my point is this. To respect the decision of every sovereign independent country. Do not impose your idea what Iraqi government should do. It is not our business. Respect Iraqi government, respect Iranian government, respect Syrian government, respect Saudi government, whatever they, are, they want to do. This was my point to support the, the, the freedom movement to bring disintegration in the region? Is it, is it really what you are looking for? Let me uh, respond maybe to Namo. We're all friends. <laughs> this will, but I will, be, I will be blunt. Who abandoned whom? The Americans begged the Kurds not to have this referendum. They said it wasn't the right time. They said this would disrupt the fight against ISIS. They said uh, you needed to talk to Baghdad first and develop a proposal that could be presented uh, to a referendum. Uh, and none of that advice was taken. And so, you know, I think the hard feelings, if we didn't have more important things to worry about, like the Iranian nuclear program and our own government and all sorts of other things, uh, the hard feelings would be quite strong in the other direction. Uh, look, Kurds and Americans have fought together against ISIS, against Saddam Hussein, and we could go through the whole litany. Uh, this Just was a bad moment in relations between the Kurds and the Americans. But you have to recognize where the interests of the Americans primarily lie, and they primarily lie with Baghdad. And that should surprise nobody. Sovereign states have interests that lie with other sovereign states. And it was a big mistake for Kurdistan to think that because it voted in a way that everybody knew it would vote, that therefore it would get recognized as a sovereign state. That's not the way these things work. Uh, so I, I don't want to underline it too much because I'm sure we'll be friends again. I'll be back on, <laughs> I'll be back on your television station. But I, I, I think you should, I, I want to change the frame a little. And the larger frame is that the Kurds abandoned the United States. Let me take a couple of I'd minutes. actually like to push back on that, Please. if you don't mind. Um, I do think that the Kurds are, are uh, correct in believing that they've been abandoned, not this time around, but rather in 1991. Um, there were a lot of promises that were made to Talibani, that were made to Kurds, that were not followed up on. And I think that the Kurds, because the Peshmerga have been such, and the YPG in Syria, have been such effective fighting forces, the US has been able to count on them and not necessarily have to put boots on the ground. And I think that in some way we need to recognize that. And I agree actually with, with your comment and as well as the previous ambassador on the panel's comment that you know, th this wasn't gone about the right way. You need to get your ducks in a row before you can have uh, your political institution. You know, you need to have the idea that you're going to get some kind of approval before you go ahead with it. And it was, interestingly, you had, you know, Iran, Turkey, and the U.S. somehow aligning on the fact that they didn't want this to go ahead, which is a strange, you know, bedfellows kind of a situation. Um, but I think it's, it, it is absolutely justifiable for Kurds to feel as though they've been abandoned in the past. Um, and I think that... Even with you know, Operation, Protect, uh, Operation Provide Comfort, which did actually designate um, and, and lead to a de facto and then de jure recognition of, of the Kurdish region, yes, the West had, had a lot to do with that. Um, and you know, a lot of the refugees that had gone into Iran and had gone into Turkey came back, but not all of them. Um, and so I think you know, to say that there are a lot more important things to think about um, is to maybe not necessarily pay attention to the Kurdish fate the way that we should. Well, one thing, if I may, the, the, the Kurds weren't the only ones who, 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 felt, who felt they were abandoned in 1991. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. true. Uh, two more quick <coughs> questions. One here. 
Uh, hello, my name is Skip Snarstall. I'm a student and just a generally curious person about these issues, and thank you for the phenomenal discussion. Um, uh, my question has to do with uh, after ISIS loses the territory it's claimed, uh, how much consideration is there to ISIS taking up <coughs> strategies now to Al Qaeda? And has the current fight against ISIS provided an effective foundation for a fight that's going to be much more centered on counterterrorism? than on conventional warfare. One more. Hi, Bob Wilcox with the Osgood Center for International Studies. My question is, uh, w is, are we going to see more of a regional approach to combat the corruption within the Middle Eastern governments, whether, well, where it's located? Thank you. The fight against corruption and the future fight against insurgency in the region. Mr. Ambassador. Well, um, uh, actually on, on, on the fight against ISIS, so um, these things started with an insurgency which uh, controlled territory, turned into a real insurrection, uh, controlled territory, de developed a proto-state, was able to start levying taxes. So now we're trying to have them go down that slope again uh, by depriving them from territory, hence the importance of liberating Mosul and, Ra and Raqqa and Syria and other places. But as they go down that slope, they're going to change their tactics, like you pointed out, and that implies that we will have to change the tactics alongside, uh, along with them. Right now, we need armies to defeat them, but as they become a terrorist organization, we'll have to go more into intelligence gathering, counterterrorism, and the interesting thing is that this has been done before. It's what we did in 2009, 2010. Uh, so, so we know how to do it. I'm pretty confident that we will be able to do it. It's incumbent upon us as a, as a, as a responsible government to its people to do it. Okay. Lisa, uh, on corruption issues, maybe? So actually, I guess on both. Um, in terms of trying to pick an ally in the region to solve uh, issues of corruption and issues of terrorism, I think picking Turkey would be a really bad choice. Um, I think it would be a very serious case of the pot calling the kettle black. Um, so, I mean, even in, in Syria right now, you know, Turkey's been fighting ISIS uh, in Syria, but the main goal has been to preserve areas such that there's not a contiguous Rojava canton, right? So we want Turkish presence in there in Idlib. We want to make sure that, uh, okay, we're, you know, we're routing out terrorism, but we also want to make sure that we don't have any kind of uh, entity that could, could declare independence for the Kurds. Um, the, and actually, in, uh, in sending Turkish forces to Idlib, um, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham basically uh, released a statement saying, you know, we're going to kind of welcome these guys because they may be able to, to help us. So there's, there's no evidence that I see. Even though Turkey did eventually end up closing its borders or, or becoming a little bit more secure about border control when it comes to ISIS, I don't see that they're moving away from their ties with extremist groups. Um, and so I don't see that they're a very good um, ally in terms of, of the fight against terrorism. Um, and again, the fight against corruption, um, you know, I've said what I had to say about Turkish corruption, so I don't necessarily, I think it needs to be done in the region. Um, and what's actually quite ironic about this <coughs> is that, so if you, for example, if you're talking about Turkey and you use the phrase AKP, you are kind of indicating that you're not a supporter of the party because AK Party, which is the uh, moniker that party supporters go for, actually means pure party or white party or a party that is free from corruption. Um, and that is a platform on which the AKP ran, um, as well as EU uh, accession and um, you know, trying to, to develop uh, the economy and so forth. So yes, I wouldn't say that, that the party that has engaged in so much corruption is a good model for the region or partner. Mohammed? Yeah, I think these two issues are tied to each other. I mean, good governance is something that's sorely needed in the region. Strong states are needed. You know, non-state actors will flourish when states are weak. It sounds uh, very simple, but this is the fact. I mean, in Lebanon, uh, what, what the country needs is a strong um, uh, armed forces contingent. It needs a strong government. The same can be said of the rest of the states in the region. So, you know, those people whose interests it is to have weak states and strong non-state actors, uh, will obviously um, uh, work to, to, to expand their interest. In many countries, it's Iran that looks for weak states and powerful non-state actors like Hezbollah uh, and the Fatimi and Zainabiyun, Afghan and Pakistani fighters that are in the Umayyad Mosque in, in Damascus now, uh, and, and its own contingent of, of uh, uh, fighters in Iraq. 
uh, making <coughs> states powerful, representative, uh, and, and promoting good governance is the only long-term solution to any of these issues. Using fire to fight fire and nitpicking over how good Hezbollah is isn't going to solve anything, really, I think. Is Hussein? Uh, dysfunctionality of the governments, bad governance, corruption, actually is and has been one of the main sources of the regional problems. Perhaps if you are going to list the root causes of crisis or the collapse of perhaps many Arab countries, you would say bad governance, dictatorship, corruption. But frankly speaking, corruption is almost everywhere in the region, including Iran. You would hear from the highest level of Iranian officials every day complaining about corruption. And what mechanism do we need? It is not only about Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan. Every country in the region, there is no exception. They, are, uh, they have problem with the corruption. About functionality of the systems, it, it's different. Of course, Iranian system is very, compared to the many other countries, they are very functional and powerful, strong. But it doesn't mean they have been able to resolve the, 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 the corruption, it is not limited to the region. Even President Trump blamed the U.S. as the, one of the most corrupted countries in the world, you know. It's, it's everywhere. Because of him. He knows of what he speaks. Yes, he does. <laughs> I am going to, with that, with that 415 <laughs> remark out of order, I am going to turn the platform back over to Rhonda Sleep. On behalf of the Middle East Institute, I wish to thank our co-sponsor, the Conflict Management Program at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Program Director Daniel Serwer, and Program Office Coordinator Isabel Talmain Long. An event of this kind is the result of many hours of work over many weeks and here on site today. I want to thank Mark Sheeland, our Director of Programs at the Middle East Institute, the MEI staff and interns who supported this conference, including Jessica Agostinelli, Scott Zuki, Lina Abu Talib, Najla As Sudairi, Megan Giovannetti, Mary Yavari, and Christine Ayad. Please join me in a round of applause for them.